Some players feel relieved when they get handed a gun in a horror game. Others fear the fact that at some point in the near future, a threat will present itself and they'll have to use said gun. Most enemies in survival horror can be dispatched with two or three clean shots to the head. Once you see that these monsters can be killed, are you still scared of the monster you are facing? Or do your concerns shift from the enemy itself to your own supply of ammunition? The survival horror genre has historically struggled to find the perfect balance. You will either find yourself helpless, without enough resources to tackle your foes directly, or you'll blaze through the map with a double-barreled shotgun like some effeminate doom guy, reducing everything in your path to scattered piles of offal. Once you learn that something can be killed, and how to kill it, you are no longer scared of the enemies themselves. Instead, your fears oscillate between evaluating your ammo supply and the number of enemies in the area. You no longer feel the sense of dread that came with your first encounter with that type of zombie or sexy nurse, just an almost robotic calculation of whether it is smart to shoot them or not. But what happens when you have a surplus of ammo, but the threat that you open fire on refuses to stay down? What I'm referring to is what I would call the roaming monster, which differs from the regular enemy types in a horror game. While the latter is spread throughout the game, can be killed and often reward you for doing so, the former does not offer you any form of catharsis, regardless of how many times you shoot them. I'm going to break down the different monsters that belong in this category, and the different mechanics that they employ to keep a constant sense of tension in the game. I'll also be explaining the similarities and differences between these horror villains, and how future games can utilize the strengths of each to create the most fearsome foe in the genre. Now, this roaming monster that I speak of is a type of enemy that cannot be killed by normal means. The enemy is usually introduced to a particular area and will stalk the player from hall to hall, and serves as a looming threat that the player must deal with repeatedly. This enemy may be able to be knocked down or scared off, but soon after, it's going to return. In this category, I will not be including monsters that come back for multiple boss fights, such as Pyramid Head, my beloved. The reason being is that the player must defeat the enemy before they can progress, after which they are safe from its grasp, at least until another scripted encounter takes place. However, it is important for me to point out that the skeleton of this formula can be found in the original Resident Evil 3, back in 1999. Nemesis, the biological weapon that was hell-bent on hunting down Jill Valentine and the remaining STARS members, would show up multiple times throughout the game. In these interactions, the player was given the choice between fleeing or facing the monster head-on. It is significantly easier to run from him, and honestly it makes more sense. If the player chooses to fight him, a boss battle will ensue, and upon defeating him, it will drop some useful weapon parts that will come in handy in later encounters. Nemesis would always come back, often with a new trick up its sleeve. Its refusal to stay dead, coupled with its constantly evolving mechanics, ensured that the player would always be on the edge of their seat, and feel a sense of dread when they were ambushed by it, at least on their first playthrough. I know that I said I wouldn't categorize enemies of this nature as roaming monsters, but Nemesis from the original Resident Evil 3 truly set the foundation for what is to come. But what happens when developers take this idea and implement it into a single location without any respite? This is where we meet Tyrant, or what most refer to as Mr. X. He is a 7 foot tall, well dressed gentleman who will stop at nothing to rip Claire Redfield and Leon Kennedy in half. While Mr. X was present in the original Resident Evil 2, it wasn't until the 2019 remake that he reached his true potential. He is the most basic example of a roaming monster, but undoubtedly one of the more imposing ones. Before I can explain why he is so effective, I should first give a brief outline of the core gameplay of Resident Evil 2. Players spend most of the game exploring the Raccoon City Police Station. It's this giant labyrinth with multiple stories. Littered throughout the station are some standard zombie enemies, which are slow moving, but are great at hindering the player's movement from one section of the map to another. There are also zombie dogs, and the more terrifying lickers, which operate in similar ways. The player must traverse the map, killing and avoiding these standard enemies, all while collecting items and completing puzzles. Each new enemy that is introduced will drastically change the ways that you interact with the map. 
And I don't just mean enemy types. One hallway that you were safely using to get to a safe room is now flooded by zombies that came in through the broken windows, which forces you to take a different route. After an hour or two, you get an idea of where the enemies are, and you learn ways to manipulate their AI and traverse the police station safely. But then, Mr. X is introduced, his hulking body lifting a crashed helicopter with ease. From this point on, your knowledge of the map and varying approaches to each section are flipped on their head. I will go ahead and say from the get-go that Mr. X isn't that much of a threat on his own, but the way that he synergizes with the other enemies makes him horrifying. This well-dressed gent is always coming for you and cannot be killed. If you decide that you have no other option, you can shoot him a few times, at which point he will kneel for a few seconds before beginning his pursuit once more. You can easily outmaneuver him in an empty room, and you can always outrun him, but the problem is that he will never stop chasing you. You could be looting a room, scavenging for much needed green herbs, but soon enough you will hear these loud, intimidating footsteps coming from the adjacent room. Time is running out. If you don't move quickly, he will break the door down and you'll be forced to face him. As I said already, he can be dealt with on his own, but he isn't on his own. The map is still crowded with other enemies. When Mr. X shows up, which doesn't give you any time to think about what you're running towards. In a desperate attempt to escape the giant, you can walk into that dreaded hallway that is full of zombies, effectively leaving you cornered and likely dead. The opposite can happen too. You might barely escape a liquor with your life, just to run into this giant as you flee, one shot away from death. I can't stress enough just how effective this is at keeping the tension and making the gameplay feel more dynamic. However, he is not without his flaws, and there is a core gameplay mechanic that disrupts the looming threat. Now, I'm not going to shit on save rooms in a Resident Evil game, because they are completely necessary, but I can't deny that the ability to hide away from Mr. X in a little room strips him of his power. We have seen him lift helicopters, punch holes in walls, and break down doors, but the fact that he can be deterred by an item box and some calming music is ridiculous. Like I said, these safe rooms are a core part of Resident Evil's identity, but they certainly serve as an obstacle for this roaming monster formula. But in the next example, this is sort of addressed. Considering that this is the most recent example, I was going to save it for last, but I couldn't help saving the final slot for the best one. Here, in Amnesia the Bunker, there is an enemy that I will be referring to as the Bunker Beast, because referring to him by his true name, which you can find out in my half assed video on the subject, would be a spoiler. This Bunker Beast is actually the reason I wanted to address this topic in the first place as he perfectly encapsulates the demand for more enemies of this type, as well as the wasted potential in this game. Before I can explain how this monster works, I again need to briefly explain the gameplay. In the bunker, you will be exploring a single location for the majority of the game. It is broken up into sections, which often require particular tools, keys and codes to access them. In addition to the bunker beast, there are groups of rats that are drawn to corpses. They don't operate in the same way that the zombies do in Resident Evil 2, and won't usually seek you out. In order to get past them, you will either have to take damage, or use resources to temporarily or permanently get rid of them. The map revolves around a single safe room, which has two lockable doors and a generator that powers the entire bunker. You are trapped, alone in the dark, and to make matters worse, there's a roaming monster, the aforementioned Bunker Beast. Unlike Mr. X, who relied on the other enemies to be truly threatening, the Bunker Beast is powerful on his own. He is constantly stalking the player and traverses the map through the walls. He can enter and exit small holes in the wall, and can even wait at the mouth of these holes when he hears a noise. If you continue to make noise, he will exit the hole and home in on your location. He will kill you in one or two hits, and moves quicker than you ever could once he has you in his sights. Your best bet for survival is to hide as he exits a hole in the wall, and pray that he doesn't follow the blood trail that you left behind. In addition to exiting the walls and pursuing you, he can lie dormant at the mouth of the hole, and when you walk past, he will drag you to your doom if you're not careful. Light is a very important part of the gameplay. The generator offers a little bit of overhead light, but when it is out of fuel, you are left to rely on your little wind-up flashlight. This thing makes noise and subsequently attracts the beast. 
Even if the lights are on, the beast causes the lights to flicker rapidly when he is prowling, which makes it very difficult to see. When you can't see, you can't navigate your surroundings, which means you can't flee. Moreover, you are left with just a revolver for most of the game. Ammunition is very scarce, and you will be lucky to find 20 rounds throughout your 4-6 hour playthrough. If he is shot 3 times in the head, the Bunker Beast will retreat, but he will be back within a few short minutes. He is truly relentless and can reach you much faster than Mr. X could. Trapped in the dark, he gives you all the motivation you need to get the fuck out of the bunker as soon as possible. All things considered, the Bunker Beast is probably an improvement on Mr. X, and he shows just how imposing and engaging a roaming monster can be. But he is not without his flaws. The Bunker Beast reacts mostly to the noise you make, with the exception of scripted sequences. If you are slow in your traversal and make little noise, the monster will remain inactive until you make a mistake. While Mr. X was like the snail that kills you when it touches you, the Bunker Beast is more like a lion, patiently waiting for its opportunity to strike. I think that both approaches work, and each evoke a feeling of constant fear, but with a little bit of know-how, the Bunker Beast can be worked around. Although the game has a safe room, the simple addition of a door lock makes the solace that it provides feel less cheap. If you fail to lock the door when the monster is in pursuit, it will bust the door down and attack you. Later in the game, it will even burrow a hole into the safe room, making it a potential location for its next ambush. Despite the innovations made, the Bunker Beast is not the best roaming monster in survival horror. I present that title to the next foe in the category. This is the ultimate predator, the Xenomorph, a perfect organism. Its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. In Alien Isolation, the developers used a combination of excellent mechanics and insane AI to make the Xenomorph even more threatening. The player is trapped on the gorgeous yet haunting Sylvester Pole Station, which is an expertly crafted location with very few survivors. The environment and atmosphere of the game are perfect, and every single system serves to immerse you in the horror. You are given very few defensive options, and there isn't a single dedicated safe room to provide you with a moment of reprieve. But of course, this game would be nothing without the unkillable roaming monster that plays cat and mouse with you for a 16 hour playthrough. At no point in the game do you feel less threatened by the Xenomorph, as it is utterly oppressive from start to finish. You are given very few defensive options, which further instills a sense of hopelessness, but you are forced to push forward using whatever you have at your disposal to outplay the alien and continue your engineer duties. You might be armed with a flamethrower and a revolver, but they will only protect you for a few short seconds before you can hear the Xenomorph re-emerge from somewhere nearby. The best addition to this game is the heartbeat sensor, which reinforces the constant presence of the alien into your head and under your skin. This tool works in tandem with the phenomenal map design and the resourcefulness of the alien itself, who will use the intricate maze of vents that are spread throughout Sevastopol. There is nothing more frightening than watching that blip on the heartbeat sensor get closer as you skulk your way through a vent, only to be face to face with the xenomorph. There's a useful crafting system that helps you use resources to make items vital to your survival, such as Molotov cocktails and noisemakers, but none of these items make the Xenomorph any less terrifying. You could have all the ammunition in the world, and it's still terrifying. It can't die. It can instantly kill you, and it's always there. Even when you manage to spray it with the flamethrower, you will likely take damage as it tramples over you to escape. There are jump scares in the game, but they are not the main reason that it's so horrifying. It's the everlasting tension, the uncertainty of whether or not it's safe to leave the desk that you're hiding under. You can hear the ominous bumps and movements from within the walls, and you'll never be certain of where it is going, or where you'll find it next. Not only can it enter and exit the vents on the walls, but it can descend from the vents on the ceilings, or use its tail to hoist you up, instantly killing you. The most frightening addition to this roaming monster is its response to the sounds that you make. Not just in the game, but in real life. If you play on consoles, the alien will hear any sound you make through your microphone and use it to track you down. While Mr. X relies heavily on the presence of other enemies to be a major threat, the Xenomorph holds its own regardless of their presence. There are androids, which are humanoid enemies that pack less of a punch on their own, but they are still deadly in groups. 
They are much more deadly when you not only have to avoid them, but the Xenomorph itself. Both enemy types need to be handled in different ways, and putting them in an encounter together makes it difficult to balance both approaches. This perfect blend of environment, resource management, and enemies not only make the Xenomorph the best roaming monster, but it makes Alien Isolation one of the greatest horror experiences of all time. So, what I have shown you now is three great examples of what I'm calling the roaming monster. Enemies of this ilk are often described as stalkers, but I don't think lumping the enemies I described in with the others does them justice. Enemies like Jack Baker and Lady Dimitrescu might be unkillable, and they can stalk you from room to room, but they're only present for a very small portion of their respective games. Then there's many of the unique enemies in Evil Within and Silent Hill games, but they serve more as scripted boss fights that you need to face head on. Furthermore, there's Chris Walker from Outlast and The Shape from Amnesia The Dark Descent, but you aren't given any defensive options against them. So the only reason that they are unkillable is because you have nothing to kill them with. Sure, I could have included them, but I believe that Mr. X, the Bunker Beast, and the Xenomorph set themselves apart by filling the player with dread for the entire game. The power that these enemies have in forcing you to shift your attention from resource management to evading a truly undefeatable threat is amazing. It immerses you in the game in a way that fodder enemies simply couldn't on their own. Different difficulty settings skew my arguments, and playing on easy or nightmare could change a player's experience drastically. Maybe you hate these kinds of enemies, and they just make progressing in the game feel tedious, and that's perfectly understandable. But I'm saying that the inclusion of a roaming monster, when done correctly, can take a survival horror game from being a shooting gallery to a truly disempowering horror experience. This video might not have actually just been an ode to the roaming monsters that I described, but a love letter to the various systems that make survival horror such a fantastic genre. I hope more and more horror titles realise the effectiveness of these enemies, and one day raise the bar higher than the Xenomorph did in 2014. These enemies should not be a gimmick, but instead a staple of survival horror.